For all of you who listen to Mac East Second Floor Studios presents Submersion and own an Android device, do me a favor. Go to the Google Play Store and download the Podcast Republic app. It's a fantastic app that allows you to get all of your favorite podcasts directly on your Android device. I use the app and I love it. I can search for the podcasts I want to listen to, select them as favorites, and have them all just a click away. Make sure to set Mackie's Second Floor Studios as a favorite so you don't miss any of our new episodes. Again, the app is the Podcast Republic app, available on Android devices. The Human Torch was denied a bank loan. <laughs> okay, episode 19. <laughs> all right. We might start off with that Human Torch denied a bank loan. <laughs> Should have been episode, I don't know, Petticoat? Episode yeah. Petticoat. I'm pretty Should've sure that episode. is not a numeral. N- nailed it. Nailed it, Joe. 9, 10, 11, <laughs> Petticoat. Yeah, that's what I learned. Perfect. <laughs> But I'm a product of the public school system. What are you guys drinking that's tonight? Supposed to mean, uh, Kyle. I know I you're little, not drinking, but what'd you pick out? Gatorade Jamie? Frost. I got a little Jack O's Firefly Amber. I don't Ooh. even know what it is. I pulled that out of Kyle's fridge. Jack O's. It's an Athens beer company. I've had their Java the Hut. It's good beer. I like Java the Hut. Yeah. What about you guys? Water. I got a summer shandy. Uh, Ooh, I, hate you. Sh- I hate Shimmer Shandy. Man after my own heart right there. I remember when one time me and Kyle were playing uh, beer pong or Beirut, and we ran out of regular beer, and we had to start filling the cups with Shimmer, Summer Shandy, and I almost puked all over myself. Was that at uh, that house party? Yeah. <laughs> we crushed. Yeah, we were. Do you remember? I text, I text Joaquin. There was this random house party going on, and I just text this guy, because we were already well into it, yeah. and I just said- we need more beer pong challengers. And all he responds is, send me an address. And yeah. he, 10 minutes later, he shows up and got defeated. Yeah. So what were people up to this fine weekend, last weekend? I can't even remember last weekend. <laughs> I know. It seems so long ago. I think the Blacked coolest out. the coolest thing, <laughs> and by that token, the nerdiest thing that happened was Monday night. We uh, finished our very first D&D session together. I've been playing for 15 years, but uh, Zach and alongside with Mustard Man, who unfortunately is not with us tonight. uh, Uh, Rest in peace. Rest in peace. (laughs) R.I.P. We're able to successfully defeat Nesnar, the Black Spider, and completed the Lost Minds of Fandelver mini campaign. Dude, Ben, again, it was like the best thing. (laughs) Loved it. Thank you. Been thinking Zach's about it. All always week. shirtless in it. I I have to go into character. <laughs> oh, I think it's mm-hmm. a it's a neat little interface we use called Roll Twenty, and it puts your little uh, avatar, like your video feed, in the bottom left hand corner, so you can see everybody while you're playing. That's a, not a sponsor. A free endorsement. Not a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, not a sponsor. <laughs> but could be. It could be. I wouldn't put it past them. Dive, dive, <laughs> dive. Oh. <laughs> Just cut right in on that conversation. (laughs) And axed it. What began as an innocent conversation among friends would soon spiral out of control and later be referred to by future generations as the eighth wonder of the modern world. Mac East Second Floor Studios takes you on the journey of your lifetime as your captains, Alex the Mustard Man, the artist formerly known as Brom, Jamie the Brain, Kyle El Capitan, and Zach the Backbone present Submersion. Mustard Man's not here, which yeah. is disappointing. Uh, Brom, what movie did we all watch? Uh, well, we watched a classic film. Uh, I mean, I'd call it a classic. We watched uh, Top Top Gun. <laughs> That's right. Oh! <laughs> oh, shit. AKA Operation Petticoat, another film that they were like, this, what's a great name? And they said, Top Gun. And he said, oh, it's going to be taken. Tom Cruise told me that that's going to be a movie. He was, he's a child right now. He's a four-year-old kid right over here. But like, he told me that it's definitely going to be a great movie. So we should not name it that. Mm-hmm. And they changed the name. True so, fact. So our second Cary Grant film. It is. It is. Um, pretty close to one another. Yeah, destination to well, pretty close in time. No, just no. in our in our oh oh yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. episodes. I was gonna say because uh, opera uh, destination Tokyo was 1943. This was 1959 film mm-hmm. uh, with Cary Grant. Yeah, and then Tony Curtis. So those are the two main stars. They were huge stars at the time. Uh, kind of Cary Grant 
coming down off of his major stardom. You can see he's got a little dust of silver in his hair. He's an older gentleman at this point. Almost even turned down this role because he was clearly way too old to be a, a submarine captain in a film. And the um, love interest thing got a little weird with well, yeah. the age. Yeah, a couple of them. Yeah, and we'll get to it, but a couple of the characters fall in love. And, you know, Tony Curtis makes sense, but then a couple of other ones, it's like, wait, they're not married? They're like... 55 and just finding love now like it seems, right. so, it seems so crazy that they wouldn't have been married or whatever that they were eligible bachelors just like palling around in a sub well yeah to each their own i know having too much fun on that sub probably Ooh, <laughs> yes they were i think i saw where Cary grant was in like eight world war ii films that's probably yeah that's probably the case i could imagine i could see him bowing out of the project just because he doesn't want to be in another world war ii movie yeah maybe this was pretty close to the yeah, as his career kind of faded into the the sunlight. So mm. one last hurrah in that submarine film. Get his submarine dream. <laughs> All right. So we open up on a little bit of a frame story. Um, we we have Cary Grant. He's an admiral now, and he's going to a uh, uh, USS Sea Tiger. Yeah, Sea Tiger, a submarine, and. We get a little scene where he like salutes this young or yeah, uh, one of the sailors and goes underneath, and the sailors like, "What's the admiral doing here?" And it's like, "Well, this is he started his career. Or he he was on this boat when it was first like commissioned, and you know we're gonna scrap it tomorrow. So what do you think he's doing here?" And they're like, "Oh no, like the submarine's gonna die." And it's like, "Yeah," and Cary Grant's there to like say farewell, and he's brought his old captain log along. Yep, and he opens, cracks that bo- baby open, and starts to read the tales of his greatest adventure, Operation Petticoat. And whoa, time travel. Yes, and we <laughs> we zoom right back in time to 1941, December 10th, 1941. And uh, they're in the Philippines. So this is actually pretty close to when the U.S. entered the war. Mm-hmm. And so they're out in the Philippines and they're kind of they have this boat and they're kind of just sitting there and there's a air raid. So the air and side, nobody is prepared. No, People are running around out. in their yeah. underwear, manning yeah. guns, just freaking out. Yeah. And they get totally bombarded and, and they're they sink the submarine. So they yes. go, oh, what a weird, strange, short movie. Like, where's the end credits? They're, the boat sank. <laughs> like, that's the end. Probably Cary Grant's dead. Yeah. I like, won't even get to see his dick. That sucks. I was really hoping for a, a double dose of that after Destination Tokyo. You better believe Whoa. it. And <laughs> you got a weird character going right now. <laughs> Ayo. Uh, and... Uh, so he goes up to his like commanding officer and is basically like, I'd like to go to Australia to to kind of get repairs and get back in the war. And like in that hunk of junk, like how is it going to be? It's very much a uh, down periscope type situation. It's well, like, even you're going to get that going. <laughs> the the guy who's running dry dock is like that thing sunk. He's like, oh come on, it's totally fixable. Yeah, and so it's it's, it's truly sunk. But the the commander's kind of like. Yeah, fine. I mean, you you can get what you you can get what you need. You still have to go through the normal channels, request the the repair stuff. It's stuff that you need for repairs. The requisitions. Yeah, and um, on top of that, like you've had a bunch of your sailors get like repositioned in different submarines. So we'll get you whoever comes in. We'll go to you, mm-hmm. like any new people. But you only have two weeks to fix this thing up in yeah. what would take a navy shipyard two months yeah, to do because they got to get the hell out of there or else i think the the japanese were probably pushing south and right so they had to move towards australia and so a montage ensues yeah and so they're trying to get stuff kind of going and they he kind of talks to the requisition guy and he's like i'm not getting anything like look at these i put a requisition for toilet paper i even gave them a sample and they said they couldn't figure out what i wanted and like blah blah, blah. based on a true story by the way uh that's, wow. actually, that's actually a true thing that happened uh to be in world war ii should I maintain that character I was just doing earlier? Yeah, probably. Whoa! Woo! And <laughs> it's gonna get real annoying real fast. <laughs> and <laughs> and so, uh, but but one of the things that happens, and really fortuitous, but it seems a real bad, is we see Tony Curtis walking around, and he's got his navy whites on. So everyone's like, "Who the fuck is that?" Like he right. looks like a total jokester. Not only that, but he's got like a little valet behind him carrying his golf clubs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he goes down, and everyone's laughing at this guy. Like, what an idiot! What is he, the good humor man? Yeah. And so they go down, and uh, Cary Grant's like, "What are you doing here?" And it's like, "Well, I'm, I'm, I basically am assigned to your ship, and you're getting out of here, and I want to get out of here." Basically, what it boils down to. And Cary Grant's like, "Well, what have you done before?" And uh, it turns out he was like the rumba partner for like the com- the admiral's mm-hmm. wife. 
And then he like did recreation at a hotel that was filled with right. like, officers or whatever. So he's basically this guy who's like skated along in the war without doing all that much was, other than schmoozing with the, the higher ups. It was funny bit. because they even asked, have you been out to sea once? He said, yes, I've been out for a week. But it was, it was a mistake, mistake. Yeah. and so they were able to get it corrected and drop yeah. me off at the next port after a week. Yeah, and so he kind of follows along, and he hears this whole spiel about them having trouble getting stuff and the requisitions. He also hears this guy playing guitar, a real sad, a real sad song. And he goes, if you don't mind, one thing that I could potentially be for you, because I really want to get out of here. I need to be on your submarine. One thing I could be is potentially your supply officer. So I'll go and get everything that you need. And uh, you just let me do my job as long as I get to choose the people that I'm doing. Give me the list and I'll find it. Mm -hmm. And this is where you kind of see that he's not, you know, super serious. He's going to be kind of the comedic. There's a good banter between him and Cary Grant most of the time. Yeah. But Cary Grant looks at him. He's like, you, Mr. Holden? Yes, sir. You'd ruin your manicure. Yeah. Uh, Don't let my manicure fool you, sir. He basically grew up, grew up on the street. And really what he's been doing and why he's schmoozing, why he's got the white. Uh, the whites on and all that is that he's been trying to move up in life like he came from the wrong side of the tracks and he's now engaged to a girl on the right side of the tracks so he's just trying to skate through this war schmooze with the uh, the uh, higher ups get a kind of a good name so he can marry this rich girl and you know that that'll be his life he's he's moved his way up and it's a lot easier to marry money than work for the money is basically essentially what he says right and but he says you know don't let it fool you i can steal whatever's not nailed down for the most part like that's how i grew up and, and then so, next scene we see them they are all dressed as burglars camouflage burglars. on the face not bu- not buglers burglars yes right? let's be clear right buglers we don't we don't, don't confuse horns. our audience no 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 and so they head off and yeah they're so they're in they kind of got blackface on i don't that's not the right term no right? it's <laughs> they literally <laughs> said it though <laughs> they, they did, did say <laughs> black they, your face yeah so uh, <laughs> i laughed at that yeah, so they're stealing all this shit from the from the you know warehouse or whatever, and then they almost get oh they're gonna get caught, but he's real quick. He's quick on his feet, mm-hmm. and you get some nice banter with him with the guards, kind of being like, "Haven't you heard? Everyone's got to have bl- blackface on." They don't. <laughs> they say face camouflage. They got we're getting blackface on. Yeah, and you better get that blackface on real quick. And uh, they, you know, and they're like, oh, my God, the admiral said, oh, I didn't hear, like, blah, blah. blah. And so they quickly do that and drive away. They're and supposed they, to have it on. He he says because yeah. Japanese planes are flying over at night. And if you look up to see one, the moon will shine off your face and then yeah. they'll be able to see you. Your pasty white face. So it's funny. They immediately put it on and then just drive away. Yeah. And so they end up getting all this shit. And even Cary Grant's called into the ad, the commander's office and he's like, you can't be stealing all this stuff. And then we get like kind of a humorous zoom out as he's like, and bring me back my wall. And cause they took his, a part of his wall to, <laughs> yeah. to get the stuff together. Um, but they've been essentially cobbled together this um, submarine and got it lifted out of the water, pumped out. It seems like it's airtight and it seems like they're able to get out of there. And so they're basically like, let's, let's go. It's time to, time to hit the road. Is there a quick, Air raid at this point? Yes. No? Yeah, there's, there's another, another air one, raid, yeah. and that's why that's they have they to decide, get yeah. out of there quicker. Yeah, that's what they decide at that point, that it's you know time to hit the road. Another air raid happens and, and time to get out. So they head out to sea. And this is about a half hour in. Yeah. Um, something that we've seen in earlier movies, which we haven't really run into in a lot, is you remember some of the other ones? It takes like 20 minutes to even get to the sub. Yeah. This one, you're immediately at the sub. Yeah. It takes about 30 minutes to get off. Yeah, it's interesting. The sub is almost the main character in the end. It's kind of this kooky sub that everything's going wrong with it. And right. And they're in this bad situation with it in the end. But the people are just occupiers of this larger character that you are going along with. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're out to sea and they're like- Oh, but before that, they yeah. have a witch doctor coming. Oh, the yeah. Sub. That was real weird. It was. I did like the end. At first, I was like, oh, this is a little culturally insensitive, like blah, blah, blah. And at the end, the witch doctor pulls off his head and it's just like, dear God, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're fucked, yeah. essentially. Because, <laughs> I mean, you hear the sub going off and it's just making all these like gurgling, farting yeah. sounds and it doesn't seem like it's going to go super well. That was annoying. I actually didn't like that sound. I didn't one like my, those one sounds of my, either. One of my least favorite parts of the film. Yeah. Um, but uh, so they they are up on the top and they're like, okay, we can't be like out in the open during the day so we actually we do have to test whether we can go underwater so let's do it and they go underwater and everything seems great he's like okay let's go to 50 they go to 50 and they're all a little on pins and needles 
they go to 100 and everything seems like it's okay. Like there's like these funny moments where it like tips for a second Mm -hmm. and then tips back. And it seems like it's everything's real weird, but it's holding up. And so he's like, okay, great. Like we're doing okay. Let's keep on going and we'll check it. And he, as he's passing to his own um, uh, bed, he sees someone bringing orange juice and he's like, huh? And he asked the guy, like, where are you going with that orange juice? And he's like, oh, I'm bringing it to Holden, uh, the t- Tony Curtis's character. And he's like, really? I'm, well, I'm going to bring him orange juice. And he's in bed and, and he's in his robe. And he's just getting up. He doesn't even know they're out to sea. He's like, well, let me just let me know when we'll dive and I'll like, you know, do my part and I'll do my you right. know thing. And like, well, we already have dived. Like, you don't understand. Like, when you're on my boat, like, you follow my rules. Like, yeah. it, this isn't this isn't going to work out if you're going to do all this shit and just be lazy in your robe and talk about tennis and he's like massaging himself because he's got tennis elbow and Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff and in the end as he's like going to get prepared and get out of get get dressed he sees that there's like a foot of water in his compartment yep so the submarines not in great shape and they've decided they have to go to get some shelter so they can uh, do some repairs real quick and there's some islands nearby and so they head that way and he sends house. out Holden to go scavenge for more supplies. Really to get him out of his hair. Yes. But, oh, boy, howdy. Does that not work out for him? Or oh, does man, it? you better see what Holden's got coming. Yeah. So and they pick up the ladies, Mama Sadies. Yes. Uh, and they, yeah, so they bring on all these ladies. There's like five of them, and they all get a boat. And then there's a, and one of them's got like huge knackers, <laughs> let me tell you. Everyone's just like, whoa, like people are dropping wrenches. They're like, that's what we're fighting for, boys. They're like, this is why I want to be captain. <laughs> basically <laughs> oh my god uh and yes yeah, it's a well endowed but clumsy uh lady that's how it described in the, in the notes that i got <laughs> um and so they they head out to see with these ladies and so he sets up all the schedule he's a, he basically relents but he's like this is going to be real bad a bunch of the guys on the boat are like they're bad luck we got to get rid of these ladies like this is no good and all that stuff but then some of them are loving it they're oh yeah horn dogs oh huge horn dogs they're like drawing lottery who to give their clothes to and like all this stuff and basically mm-hmm. like cater to them and who's going to you know, fall in love with them. And, and it was kind of like reminiscent yeah. of down Periscope. Yeah. I mean, granted this is before, but you know, were they putting some of the women into really tight clothes? She's like, Oh, this is just too tight. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, there's, I was surprised at the, the sheer number of sex jokes and how ridiculous it was. Also Tony mm-hmm. Curtis hitting on that, the one lady that he ends up getting with was yeah. making me a little uncomfortable. It at was times. very creepy. There was a lot of pressure being put on her. <laughs> like he yeah. was like creeping up real close to her, like kind of pinning her into the corner and mm-hmm. kind of being like, well, why, why don't we just like hang out here? It's no big deal. Like blah, blah, blah. And meanwhile, he's like engaged and stuff as well. So mm-hmm. not coming off great. Not a great no. reflection of the times. It was a little rapey. It's a little, you just like, got a, a tad bit of rapey in there. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. They kind of like goofy. Oh, even a bit. even during this, um, Holden is able to pull in Barbara as the one he's after, yeah. and Dolores is the one, the clumsy one. Yeah. Yep. But so he gets a bottle of champagne mm. and he's about to pop it and you know celebrate with Barbara, and all of a sudden, Cap Sherman, who is um, why can't I remember his name? Cary Grant, Grant. Yeah. Comes in and kind of like nonchalantly, he never blows up on him no 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 he's yeah. always like really level-headed and cool but yeah. he just starts like he's like oh well on my ship we can't have any of this alcohol he starts pouring it out yeah, and yeah, yeah. all that stuff yeah and so then they they end up cutting near another island and they see some a japanese tanker and so they they've been one of the big things is like just like in any of these war movies is everyone's clamoring to get a kill so they really want to sink this boat and they're like you know, this could blow up our spot. We're not really in the best shape to be like evading the enemy, but let's let's sink this tanker. This is gonna be great. And so they, they size up this tanker, gets a torpedo ready, and uh oh, the clumsy one, Dolores, comes up the ladder and hits the button too soon, and yes. the torpedo goes <laughs> misses the boat, goes up on the beach and blows up a truck. Also based on a true story. I get to that in, into the trivia. <laughs> it's got to my favorite quote of the entire movie, which was, "He gets all angry, and he's then he's he's writing furiously in his notebook, his little journal." 23 December 1941. Sighted tanker, sank truck. Today, for the first time in my life, I came close to hitting a woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That's our captain. Yeah, and... it was but it's so funny because his voice is just like yeah. real calm about it. Yeah. It was cracking me up when he said it. And uh, yeah, and I, I, I can feel him. I mean, that when you're a captain of the boat and you have the opportunity to pull that dick out and show what's up and then it gets screwed up, 
That's a, just a case of blue balls. You're yeah. Not, you're not liking that. Mm-hmm. Well, so they get fired on. They immediately yeah. have to leave. But then they're able to get to the army port, which is where Saber, they're going to yeah. drop the uh, women off. Yeah. They're like, thank God we can get these broads off of here. Yeah. But then at the army base, they're like, well, guess what? We're going to head up into the foothills yeah. to do some guerrilla warfare. <laughs> and we could be there for years. Yeah. We'll you give- want to bring these women with us? And they were like, no, I guess not. But they were like, okay, well, we got to fix up, continue to fix up this boat and get more stuff. Uh, and so, like, they they're basically, a casino. Yeah, they're like, you know, everything's too expensive. We can't get anything. And they're like, oh, we're going to put Holden in the job. So Holden's like the lifesaver in all of this because he sets up a casino and he gets everyone to buy chips by giving up supplies. Like, that's how you get, you, you're not buying in with money, you're buying in with supplies. Mm-hmm. They're able to get all this stuff, including some red and white paint, uh, paint primer uh, to go underneath a gray, the gray coat. And so, <clears throat> while they're painting up the boat and they're painted first pink because they only have enough of the white and red, so they have to mix it. Or yeah, they have to mix it together. So they paint their submarine pink. Luckily, they're going to cover it up in gray. Otherwise, right. it'd look ridiculous. Am I right? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen next. No. Uh, but at the same time, Holden uh, heads up into the foothills himself and <laughs> captures himself a pig. Yes. Uh, for a feast and kind of. Um, I don't want to say he screws up everything up because everything works out okay. They get the, get the pig. They kind of have to evade capture a little bit. They dress up the pig and pretend he's like a drunk. Yeah, because they, they go to member. like a military checkpoint. And yeah. it's funny because uh, the guy there was like. No, I don't know why they call them submarines pig boats. Man, he was the ugliest. Because <laughs> they got a pig in a yeah. hood. And so they put, the, they put the pig in the bathroom. <clears throat> and the people come on onto the boat and they're military like, police. military police. And they're like, well, we, this guy's saying that the, someone stole their pig and you're the only guys who passed by here. And they're like, well, no, we do have this drunk sailor, but like he's in no shape to go with you guys right now. I'm going to discipline him. Because this is all yeah. part of the ruse. Yeah. Because Holden told them that there was this guy, yeah. I can't remember his name, but the yeah. pig was a drunk dude. And we're seeing Sherman kind of be like the captain that everyone loves. Why he like, why everyone loves him. Because he goes along with it like, he wants that pig for the for the feast for his men as well. Like he he likes that idea, but at the same time he wants to get holding a little comeuppance as well. So mm-hmm. he's like, I'll pay I'll pay for the pig. It's like, oh no, it's too expensive for money. Well, let's see what we can do. And he goes into Holden's apartment and basically gives Everything. him all the stuff: golf bag, tennis racket, the massage thing, you know, glasses, all kinds of stuff that the guy really really likes. What's funny is Zapatos, his shoes, mm-hmm. and so yeah, they're in the they're in the you know Philippines, and so the guy it's I don't know if it's a mixture of like Philippines and Spanish because at some points it was Spanish words that he was saying, at other points it was seemed like it was just gibberish. I don't know the Filipino language, so you're not an expert. That's not, I thought you got your degree in Filipino. Well, one that was my minor. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, minor. That's right. Okay. <clears throat> and so uh, right when they're about to go, so they have the stuff to put their the gray primer on, and they're having their feast on this pink submarine. And uh, cuz why having the piece was it was it some holiday? Oh, it was, it was New Year's. New Year's. Yeah, that's right. Cuz it was holiday all movie, New Year's. Yeah, it's New Year's movie. And Holden has Barbara off on a beach and they're oh, kind of yeah, like Oh, yeah, they're canoodling. <laughs> yeah, flirting, Ooh, but then yeah. he's like, "Oh, it was FYI, weird though. I'm engaged." Yeah, it was weird though that they had that extensive uh, full penetration sex scene at this point. It was. It was, it was weird for a 1959 film. You would have thought it wouldn't. Well, whatever. Yeah. I enjoyed it. And then uh but she's like unhappy because revealed that he's engaged so she swims back to the submarine while he mm-hmm. makes his way back on this ridiculously small lifeboat yeah like, just comically small didn't make any sense and really <laughs> just a proper movie yeah and also at this time captains uh forgave dolores for setting off the torpedo because he wants he's to get looking a little lonely yeah he's feeling pretty good also the the engine room guy is like so there's like an older lady, one of the old, like, like more of the commanding officer of the ladies group. Yes. And she's also like a machinist. And so they're like canoodling as well. Everyone's getting with these ladies. Mm-hmm. And, and so, then all of a sudden air raid sirens. Another air raid. It's like, it's like the story of this, this, uh, this movie is air raids, air yeah. raid, air raid, air raid. So they get another air raid and they're like, okay, we can't put the, the gray paint on. And one guy's the chief of the boats, like real upset about it. He's like, God, fuck, I'm going to have this pink boat. This sucks. Uh, but at the same time, Holden brings, like, they already have all these women, but he brings all these families on. They go, for, for helping set up the casino, I promised that all the dealers and their families could end up, you know, coming onto the boat. <laughs> yeah. So I have children and a goat and like all kinds of shit. And a bunch of pregnant women, they're like, they're about ready to pop. Like, literally, because <laughs> yeah. then they immediately have babies. Yeah. 
That's funny. And so we get a bunch, we get some funny scenes of them kind of like trying to take care of these women and and having babies and all the submariners. Oh, submariners one of them are really getting, funny. Are getting really into it. Like they're playing hide and seek with the kids, and one of the one of the guys is having sympathy pains, and he's like yeah. up in his bunk, and <laughs> so, yeah, it's basically gone to total uh, just craziness on this boat. Yes. Oh man. And so then they so Tokyo Rose announces that there's some. Oh, there's some American, you know, pink submarine out there, and you know, they're blah blah blah, all this stuff. And they're like, "Okay, get yourself up. Yeah, you're yeah, too yeah. visible. You're too visible. We're gonna get you." And they're like, "Well, the good thing is that if they know about us, the Americans surely do." And we yeah. get a cut scene real quick of the Americans being like, "We don't know anything about this pink submarine. Probably all of us. We should pink. We should, we should sink any pink submarine." So that yes. now they're they're being attacked by both sides essentially. And then all of a sudden, uh, we see an American destroyer through the periscope. Everybody's excited. They're like, thank God we're going to be rescued. They surface, get up there. And, and what happens? The destroyer starts unloading. <laughs> yep. And they dive. And for the fourth movie in a row, is it a fifth movie in a row? We're getting some death charges. Dude, we get it. It has been death, death charge. charge central here. I guess maybe it's because we've been so uh, World War II central, centric. Could be. Lately. There's death charges everywhere on these guys. Yes. And, and so, they use a tactic here that we've seen in always, many so of the movies. Much. Yeah, yeah. Which okay. is funny because I feel like when I first started watching these movies, I was like, oh, that's clever. Like you kind of make it seem like whatever. Yeah. Now it seems like no one would ever believe it. It's like, oh, no, everyone was doing it. Just like shit would be popping up in the ocean all day. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, no, wait around here. We're going to yeah. find it. <laughs> yeah. It's funny. Even one of the commanders is like, oh, we sunk them. And the other guy's like, well, maybe they're just trying to trick us. Let's stick around. I was like, yeah, you better learn that quick because it right. seems like the first thing everyone does is just throw a bunch of shit in a torpedo tube. <laughs> it's like uh, dead bodies floating up. They're like, they may have just had some dead on board. It's like yeah. that happened in almost every film we have. <laughs> Day one of submarine school. Yeah, I know. Yes. Did any of you guys notice when the destroyer was sending off the depth charges? Um, this immediately caught my attention. It was making a noise like uh, a um, like an ATAT from Star Wars. Oh, sure. Continue depth charge. <laughs> Definitely noticed that. <laughs> okay. All right. I want to make sure I wasn't the only one. And I even went afterwards and was like looking up the sounds. I'm like, wow, that's a very similar sound. Yeah. The other thing I w do want to note at this point, because they were, it was a pretty nice scene of them doing the depth charges, like a pretty, um, you got to see all like the levels of it and it kind of shooting off the side and you see yeah. the big explosions, some cool scenes like that. Um, and I did want to note how good a lot of the uh, war stuff was. Like the air raids weren't models or anything like that. Those were airplanes kind of flying over it looked and legit. doing some cool stuff. Yeah. And you got at the end, they kind of had a thank you to the U.S. Um, Department of Defense and the military for helping them, you know, stage the, the those scenes and stuff. Yeah. So. And so, but the, the destroyer did yeah. not buy... No. The first attempt to throw things up the tube, but then they're like, wait a minute, let's take all the ladies' underwear yeah. and put it out the tubes. That'll let them know and that we're American. Classic comedic fashion, Captain Sherman's like, all oh, the ladies, please give us your undergarments. And they're like, whoa, whoa what? <laughs> But of course, they shoot them out of this thing, and everyone's like, "The Japanese surely don't have these." And their big old knocker bras <laughs> are on board, and they're like, "Oh my god!" And you get the eyes popped out, a woo god, and they turned into like a wolf. It was yep. crazy. I was. Uh, I feel like that was probably pretty risque for 1959. The whole movie was pretty risque for 1959. I think so. There were some jokes in there that it was all implied stuff, but it was like. It was pretty racy. For, for, I feel feel like what they were implying, uh, even I was like, oh, shit. Like, cool. Okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then it was like pretty rapey, too. So, um, Very. Yeah. So in the end, we we go back into the frame story. He's been reminiscing. Oh, Ooh, we're back into the frame. What the heck? Right on time. I don't know how I shut that off so fast. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so they, they're able to, basically, they, they don't get bombed and they get to Australia. Right. Blah, blah. So we, we go back and... Um, Cary Grant's, you know, closing up his book and he's like, gee, Willikers, that sure was a great adventure. Uh, uh, I'd probably get an Oscar for this one. And then he goes up on board and we see that, oh boy, he's the Admiral, but who's the captain? Oh you no. You would never believe it. Is it Holden? It is. Oh. And so Tony Curtis comes up and he's like, boy, oh boy, I sure do love this submarine. He's like, I got you a little gift. And he shows him the thing. He's like, were you, did you write everything in this book? And Cary Grant's like, oh, I sure did. Wink, wink. Yeah. And then he's like. Oh shit! <laughs> but we also see at this point that Holden is now married to oh, yeah. Barbara. Oh yeah, and has kids. Yep, kids. And then they're like, "Oh, where's your wife?" And he's like, "Oh, she's coming, but she's bumbling, stumbling." And she drives up and she crashes into the back of a bus. 
Oh, he no, in back his car, car, and then the car hooks onto the bus, and the bus takes off, takes and off the car is hooked onto it. And he's got a whole bunch of kids, too. One of the kids was like, looked like she was like 15 years, 16 years old. I was like, how much later? And then I thought about it. I was like, no, that's about right. They just got busy quick. Like, basically, they got off that submarine in Australia and got pregnant right there, yep. and then and there. You ever seen a koala that's bear? That's the baby boomers, man. Is that, where, is that Koala bears are aphrodisiacs. Oh, I see. I thought you were saying something about their sex life. No. They, they, but they make other. Is that a humans. move? The koala bear? No, no, no. I thought you meant that koala bears had some kind of like, they couldn't stop having babies. Like they just were like fuck all day. I thought they just slept all day. Yeah, the, yeah right. I think they do. Yeah, don't they sleep like twenty three hours? I don't well, know. Welcome to somebody, Koala Cast. Somebody get on. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> our next uh, next podcast. Yeah, koalas, <laughs> cool. I know they eat a lot of eucalyptus, which gets them high. I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So our first episode will be us just eating a ton of eucalyptus and seeing if we experience the same effects. I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> Damn it, Brom. What about koala movies? How many koala movies do you have? There was that TV show, that cartoon. Was it koala? Well, there was like the magic koalas and they flew in the air and like rainbows what? flew behind them. Sounds no awesome. One, no one know about this one? Didn't you guys watch it? I used yep. to watch a show called Biker Mice from Mars, no. which was badass. Anyways, we got on a little <laughs> tangent about these koalas. Uh, let's get some final grades. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let's let's grade this thing, Brom. What do you think about this? Oh, we're gonna no. Let's you know what? Let's start with someone else. I knew I knew you were gonna make me go first. And no, then... no, 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 no. We're gonna Zach. Zach, you go first. Who me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um. The other uh, Zach. Um, <laughs> Jack Dawson. Um. No. <laughs> so I got guys. I, let me be honest. I get that you say, oh, it's a classic. Oh, it has a seven point something IMDb. Oh, it's this guy. I turned it off. I couldn't stand it. I found it. Oh, my God. One of the most unentertaining things I've watched that yet in this podcast. <laughs> you know, they got to that scene where they painted their faces black. <laughs> and then I watched five minutes after that. You were and I was so like, right, offended I'm by done. that that you had to turn it off. <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> I, sk- I started skimming through it, skimming through it. And I was like, all right, I've had enough. So that's my thoughts on this so, movie. So what's that translate what's to score? score wise? Probably like a one. A one. Like right. it, it beats I, out Crimson Tide. I'm just not, <laughs> just not enjoying it. It's not entertaining. Uh, okay. All right, Brian. What you got? All right, I think I'm gonna bring this one back to earth a little bit. <laughs> uh, so I uh, I watched it, and uh, when I sort of hovered over it to start watching, I saw it was uh, pitched as an action, romance, and comedy film. And ultimately, when I finished it, I felt like there wasn't really a whole lot of some of these uh, action-wise. We had the torpedo scene where they misfire and blow up a yeah. truck, and then we had the depth depth charge scene. Beyond that, it was pretty thin on the action side of things. Romance-wise, uh, for 1959, it might have been a little risque for contemporary contemporary. I wouldn't necessarily era. call it a romance. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's a bunch of horn dogs <laughs> lusting after some ladies, if you can call that romance. Right. Isn't that what romance is? I guess so. <laughs> But not in 1959, uh, romance translated to crossing paths with the ladies and brushing elbows with them in the narrow halls of the sub. And, of course, we had a few rapey scenes with Tony Curtis. And on the comedy side of things, now this is a little more subjective, and I debated if I should let it affect my rating. But the movie was likely very much funnier in 1959. And 2018, I felt, you know, a lot of the comedic moments were likely lost on me. Like, I'll admit I probably was missing stuff. Um, just being what, what is this? Fifty years, sixty years later, and as you three will probably agree, slapstick and visual comedy I don't think really age as well. So I would have liked to have seen you know less of Cary Grant sitting on hair curlers and more of the Tony Curtis hijinks, which I thought the scenes of Curtis, you know, swindling his way to respect and relevance, uh, retained a lot of the charm that I expected from a classic film, and it went a long way to salvaging the movie for me. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, I don't intend to rewatch it anytime soon, but I did witness the merit of it at points. And I'm glad that, you know, this podcast was, you know, able to put this movie in front of me. I'm going to give it a five and a half. Okay. All righty. And I'm going to go even further to Earth because uh, uh, I really actually 
quite enjoyed this film. Um, I did. Lo- I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the hair curler scene, which is probably the worst scene in the entire film. Yeah. Um, uh, it was actually bizarre that it was even in it. It made it seem like it was much worse made than it actually was because it was really bad and mm-hmm. really badly staged and really badly edited. I'm not sure how it ended up in, in, in this film. But um, I do think, yeah, comedy doesn't necessarily age, you know, perfectly over time. But I felt like this one had a lot of that Tony Curtis aspect to it that I really enjoyed. And it did get an Oscar nomination for Best Original Screenplay. So I do think that's something uh, like a little bit of an evidence that at the time it was pretty well regarded what they mm-hmm. what the jokes that were written and stuff like that but i had a i had a great time actually watching it and i kind of debated whether i wanted to put this um at or above uh run silent run deep and in the end i settled at an 8.0 to a tie with run silent run deep wow i really, really really liked it yeah i did okay I don't know. I I feel like I'm Brom right now. I feel like I should climb into a torpedo tube right now. <laughs> the only good thing is that we already inject ejected mustard man. <laughs> That's why it's not here. Yeah. We can't he's run like, a show with just three. He said, get out of here, mustard man. All right, Kyle, um, bring it back to space. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for me, like you guys said, comedy or the action. Oh, yeah, no. Wasn't a, I didn't, wasn't particularly it's a com- fond it's a of comedy. the action. It's a comedy film. Yeah, yeah. it is a comedy I thought it was some of the <laughs> some of the stuff was funny. Uh, I did particularly like all the hijinks with Tony Curtis. Those, yeah, those were pretty a, great. A lot of those things were pretty good. And the pig some, and yeah. getting people onto the boat. And I did know, particularly like, like the whole pig situation. I thought it was pretty funny. I think I think it, yeah, it's weird though. Like Cary Grant's such a big part of it, but he's kind of an older type of humor. Yeah, I and know, and I don't strange. dislike that humor. Yeah. Um, I enjoy certain like some of the dry humor and lines like that. But uh, like we talked about the slapstick stuff, that's never done it for me. Mm. Like Three Stooges type stuff, it's not my style. So I'm going to probably put this like a... It was also very long. 525. 525? Yeah. All right. I'm not too surprised by this. I am a little surprised that someone else didn't... I, I, I assume... Alex actually, he said he watched it a whole bunch of times. So I assume he would have been one of the kind of saying that it was pretty good, right? He likes yeah. a lot of those older movies. Yeah. I was going to say, I feel I feel like I am I guess with the full five would have been more what I expected. Mm-hmm. A couple people really liking it, someone not liking it, and then a couple people in the middle. Like that makes sense for an older film Man. because it is, it is just depending on your flavor and, you know, potentially even your mood that day. Like it could be like there's a day that you could enjoy something that's a little slower and you know, more slapsticky, and then another day where it's like, I'm just not, this isn't what I'm into. <laughs> like, I'm not going to watch this. Yeah, like so. I saw you last night, and I said, I'm an hour in, does this get better? And <laughs> I said I actually, li- I, I said I preferred the front part of it a little bit better than the second half, yeah. and I really liked it, though. And yeah. then I, I enjoyed the second half, I think, better today. I don't know. Rethinking it, I think that the second half is the more rewatchable half. I just, yeah. in my mind, it honestly is that the sh- hair curler thing. That's what in my mind. The second half, I was like, "What the fuck is this? What just happened?" That yeah. is the worst. One of the worst. How could you do this to me? <laughs> no, I'm serious. Like, I don't. You're going to be a ten. How is it possible that a film that is a major motion picture? It was the third highest grossing film of that year. I think that's right. Third or fourth. So I read. And, and it, with Academy Award winning or nominated script, has a scene in it where you look at it and be like, "Is this amateur hour? What the fuck is this? Like, that's crazy." <laughs> All right, you tell me you've never seen a Daniel Day Lewis movie where he just like sits on a hair curler real and quick. Then and, like, stand, ah! and then stands up and then freezes and then yeah. goes, Ugh! and then sits there for a second as it fades to black. Yeah. It's weird. <laughs> that happened in Lincoln. That's right. That did happen in Lincoln. <laughs> uh, I, need, uh, I need one of our fans to make us a little meme with uh, two panels. The first panel is Cary Grant sitting on the the hair curler and the second panel is uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi saying you were the chosen one (laughs) I don't okay (laughs) you're pretty artistically talented I think you can take that one (laughs) Uh, all right so should I get to some trivia yeah let's do it okay so as I mentioned briefly throughout the recap some of the plot points in the movie were based on real life incidents most notable are scenes set at the opening of World War II based on the actual sinking of the submarine USS Sea Lion and SS-195, which is Sargo-class sub. 
Keep in mind, I was a Sargo class sub. Mm, mm -hmm. Name sounds kind of familiar. Sargo class sub. Uh, sunk at the pier at uh, Cavite Navy Yard in the Philippines. Commander Sherman's letter to the Supply Department on the inexplicable lack of toilet paper based on an actual letter to the Supply Department of Mare Island Naval Shipyard by Lieutenant Commander uh, James Wigan Coe of the submarine Skipjack SS 184, which I think is also a Sarko class. And the need to paint a submarine pink due to lack of enough red lead or white lead undercoat paint. That was also a real story. Really? Yeah. So they, they had a couple cases of... of submarines ending up either red or pink one was that the uh top coat burned off in an attack and there was a red for a while there was a red submarine and it was actually was referred to over tokyo rose or over the japanese programming talking about the the red u.s pirate ship wow and, and so that That's was a real thing and then the pink thing is a little hazier it seems like it's one of those things where it's like maybe a rumor or kind mm -hmm. of a joke because it wasn't necessarily tied to a specific submarine that was pink so as for those are all what it's based on. The submarines that were actually used in the production were Balao class, uh, class submarines. The USS Balao, SS-285, it was painted pink and used uh, for the exterior shots for those scenes um, and shot that was shot at, outside Key West. USS Archerfish, SS-311, uh, it was the gray and black and was used for interior and exterior shots. Uh, that was also filmed in Key West. And then USS Queenfish, SS-393, which was used in the opening and closing framing story. And that was used, uh, that was uh, filmed around San Diego. Can you imagine if you're out on some kind of, you know, deep water fishing expedition, you just look out, is that a pink submarine over there? Oh, yeah. What the hell? Yeah, that would be pretty awesome. I it's so. basically my dream mm -hmm. when they remake this film with Zach Galifianakis. Can we catch that? Um in the film, the submarine is on constant quest to reach a submarine repair ship to restore operational status. Uh, in real life, Tony Curtis served on the submarine repair ship USS uh, Pro Proteus, Proteus during World War II. It's also alleged that he enlisted in the submarine force uh, as b because he was inspired by Destination Tokyo starring Cary Grant. And that was supported wow. by some interviews that he did where he said that he, uh, when he got the part, he lobbied for Cary Grant to be, to be in the role because it was such an inspiration. And he was such an idol to him. That's pretty cool. No, uh, this is kind of just a trivia that I, I enjoy because I, I wondered it as well. Is the nurses wonder why the toilet is called the head? Oh, this is a joke that I thought was a little risque. They talk about the head and, and what it means, and I was like, are they implying something? That I don't know. Oh. anyways, uh, it's because in early sailing ships, the toilet for enlisted sailors was a series of holes like an outhouse that was perched over the bow or the head of the ship. And the location was practical because the wind was always blowing backwards from it. So you wouldn't end up somehow ending up back in the stink or whatever. Mm -hmm. But then the commanders actually were in the, were in the back of the, the other side of the ship. Their, their outhouse was in the back of the ship. Really? Aft, yeah. But anyways, the head is because of that. All the toilets were at the head of the ship. Huh. Head of the boat. Sorry. God. I'm really, well, you were talking. I'm coming deeper into this ejection tube as I speak. Wait, but they would... In a submarine, they would have an outhouse type situation. That's what they said. Oh, I mean, maybe it, maybe the head is just a carryover from gotcha. larger ships where yeah. it'd be up above. So I wouldn't think you'd be just hanging over. You'd have to always surface, and that'd be real weird. It would be. <laughs> I've been Keep holding taking water. On I've been from that outhouse. I've been holding it for sixty days. <laughs> <laughs> nurse, Let me out of here. Nurse Barbara, the love interest of Tony Curtis's character, was played in the 1977 remake, the remake being the TV show, mm. by Tony Curtis's daughter, Jamie Lee Curtis. I didn't even Boom. know that. I didn't know Jamie Lee Curtis was Tony Curtis's daughter. That's crazy. My mom did. Oh, really? Yeah, she uh, walked by when I was watching this, and uh, she recognized Tony Curtis immediately. She's like, oh, this is from my day. I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I do want to mention before I get to my final one that, uh, if you have any interest in hearing a crazy story, read up a little bit on Cary Grant because his life was crazy and a little fucked up and pretty weird. Really? Uh, at the time of this filming, he was way into the experimental use of LSD to try to work with some of his, um, anxiety and depression issues, uh, and work through kind of his childhood because there was a, basically his mom was put into an institution by his dad and his dad just told him that his mom had died when he was like a kid and then he didn't find out until he was 31 that his mom was still alive and in this like 
asylum in in the United Kingdom. And he went and visit like, and he dealt with like all that, like his entire life was a lot of like the stuff from his childhood was like totally screwed up. And LSD was one of the ways that he coped. But yeah, there's stories of him kind of being on LSD the whole time that he was like doing this film and doing all like the interviews for it and stuff. This movie. Yeah. Anyways, finally, I'm going to finish up with Jeff Chandler. I was originally offered the role that went to Cary Grant. I didn't even know who Jeff Chandler was. Apparently he was a huge star at this time. Actually, sadly died of surgical um, complications at a young age. Um, And Grant himself was uh, reluctant to take it, knowing he was much too old to play a wartime captain. In addition to his acting, Jeff Chandler was known for his good looks, his distinguished gray hair, and for his musical recordings. Who does that sound like? I'm looking at you, Brom. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> known for your good looks and your distinguished gray hair, right? And your musical uh, recordings. I definitely don't have gray hair. I, I thought, thought you were a silver but, fox. Uh, no? No, but uh, everything else is correct. Oh, okay. Um, Bob Hope always said it was his biggest regret that he turned on the movie. This actually would have been, I mean, I think, I think what you're talking about with the humor being kind of old, it is kind of Bob Hopey humor. If you mm-hmm. ever watch Bob Hope, like old recordings, uh, you sit there stone faced for a while being like, wait, is this really what, like the greatest comedian of his time, <laughs> of right. his time was like, Jesus, it's like one liner after one liner. And most of them were like super lame. Um, and then finally, Tina Lu- Louise was offered, but turned on the role of nurse Crandall being the, the busty nurse. Oh, um, and it went Dolores. To, yeah, it went to Joan O'Brien instead because she didn't like the abundant boob jokes directed at the character, Louise. Um, so she played Ginger on Gilligan's Island. So what other Gilligan's Island characters would have been good for this film? What about Gilligan? Who would he have played? Gilligan, well, oh, man. I was going to say Tony Scott. Tony Curtis no. is kind of too... It's too suave. Can't he do is. It, yeah. It's He's too a, clever. I feel I like it's have, got it. What is, I've that? never seen Gilligan act in anything else. He might be able to do the, the Tony Curtis character because we want to see sort of the ditzy Gilligan character. I th- I'm thinking the guy who had the the tattoo on his chest, which we didn't even mention, but he had like a naked lady tattooed on his chest. He was kind of a bumbling fool. Oh, yeah. I could see him. Or who else? I don't know. Maybe the – he had a minor role, but the the convict – who was brought on board? Oh, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, what about the skipper? Hmm. Skipper, I would. It's probably put, our Cary Grant me- character. <laughs> you think so? Yeah, I'd I put him so. as the mechanic. I would say he's the yeah. engine room guy, right? He's cur- curmudgeon. What about the uh, millionaire's wife? Millionaire's wife. She would be. I feel like it, you, you'd have to add a scene where they do a flashback. Mm-hmm. To Tony Curtis doing the rumba with the admiral's wife. Oh, it would be the funny. admiral would be the millionaire and his wife. That'd be funny. There we go. It'd be real funny. I'm like a really funny guy. You're so funny. <laughs> I made like a bunch of like, it's like a real funny joke that you could add into it. Awesome. Great. Um, what about the movie star? The movie star. Uh, and the rest. That's Ginger, right? <laughs> oh, it is Ginger. That is Ginger. So, so she, she would be the bus. Be for sure. Yeah. You got to get in there. Uh, what about the professor? Professor, I'd probably put as Cary Grant. Yeah, I think that's right. And then what about Marianne? You know what? Let's do this. She's Tony Curtis's character. No. Boom! Lesbian love triangle. That's what I'm thinking. Wow. Oh, We're yeah. all thinking it, guys. Probably be better than what they would come up with, like a full blown remake nowadays. It'd be like Kevin Hart and The Rock. <laughs> and it's not that. Shit like that. That's what I want to see. Uh, <laughs> I would watch that Operation Petticoat. Oh, for man. Sure. The what about what about so Frasier? Stupid. If we're doing, awesome. f- we'll do Frasier and Rob Schneider. Kelsey Grammer, Kelsey Ooh. Grammer and Rob Schneider, like down Periscope. Wait, what? That's already been done. <laughs> no. Um, and then last but not least, the best character from Gilligan's Island, Ed Harris. Ed Harris. He played the uh, the native, right? No. Oh, the witch doctor. <laughs> well, he pulls off the mask and it's Ed Harris. I mean, in, in, in true Eddie Murphy fashion, he'd be playing a lot of different characters, including yes. ones that are somewhat offensive. Um, I would Ed Harris would be, be... Would he be the captain or would he be, would he be Holden? Oh, man. I'd, I'd want him as Holden. Really? It's well, he has that you know commanding captain-like ability. I feel, like it, I feel like you get old Ed Harris for the captain and then... Young, ripped, rippling abs, just like grease, just pouring down the creases of his body yes. uh, as Holden, right? Sure. 
You could do a cameo with him, uh, you know, just like a homage to him, bring him on board and uh, have him be like the guy that turns them away when they try to drop the women off at the island. Or or you just look and in the captain's quarters, there's just like a headshot of Ed Harris. I'm Ed Harris. And he's like, love you, Ed. I won't let you down. <laughs> and that's all you see. You're like, what? What the hell was that? Yeah. Um, all right. Let me just finish up my part with the Phantom Zone. Whoop. Engage the Phantom. Phantom's engaged, sir. Now, um, we just did Des- Destination Tokyo not that long ago. Mm. So, so this should be pretty easy. Really easy. Because uh, I actually used this as part of that Phantom Zone. Uh, so we used Operation Petticoat and features a Gavin McLeod. He also played the seaman in Mikhail's Navy. And remember, I made sure to note in that episode that it was not the Tom Arnold classic. It was the original one that's probably worse because it does not feature Tom Arnold. Correct. And in that, I was a little worried, but there is a Japanese sub. They're, they're chasing a Japanese sub, but we'll mm. never watch it because it fe- it's mostly about a, uh, a ship, not a boat. Uh, anyways, that one has Ernest Borgnine. And oh, there's even a whole bunch. Yeah, yeah. yeah, So we used uh, Tor- Torpedo Run, which had LQ Jones. He was also in Battle of Coral Sea that features... Teru Shimada. Teru Shimada has probably been in a huge, just like a ridiculous number of these Phantom Zones because mm-hmm. we've used him from You Only Live Twice. And from there, you can follow the previous path back to uh, Phantom with Ed Harris. And that's like Connery and Hent for October uh, to In Enemy Hands to U571 to Navy Seals to the Abyss to Phantom. Craziness. Thank you. Always works. It does. It never doesn't work until it doesn't work. And then I will punch you in the face and I'll leave Next this week's forever. movie, uh, I don't know. I promise I will I will eject myself from a torpedo tube if I can't do this one week. All right. I imagine you're going to be like Charlie uh, in the mail room from Always Sunny, <laughs> tying the people together. <laughs> <laughs> what was the name? Carol! Uh, Pen, what is it? Penn, Sylvania. It's like something, uh, Sylvania, right? <laughs> Sylvia. Pepe Sylvia. That's right. Pepe oh, Sylvia. Yeah. Pepe Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> this whole place is a goddamn ghost town, man. Yeah. <laughs> I totally forgot about that episode. <laughs> it's it's sub 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 world world wide 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 wide. All right, so you may have heard earlier Jamie allude to the Sargo class. Yeah, and we won't actually see a, an actual Sargo class in any of the films. None of the Sargo class, which is kind of a smaller class of submarines were actually featured in in a motion picture, which sucks. Yeah, um, but anyway, these were a fir- Yeah, sorry, these were among the first subs to be sent into combat for World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor. So these are an Asiatic fleet of subs. So the uh, U- the USS Swordfish is actually the first U.S. Navy vessel to sink a Japanese ship in World War II, and. These boats included a new standard in the U.S. Navy batteries, the Sargo battery, which was made to resist water damage due to depth charging. So, we got some kind of interesting stories on these things later, but for that, let's just get into some specs. So, there were two different types of propulsion systems for these um, things, and there's, if you go on the Wikipedia page, there's just like mounds of information on the difference, but... um, you have a composite direct drive and a diesel electric. The first six were made this way, but then the other, the last four were made with a full diesel electric system. So the displacement is 1,450 tons, length 310 feet, 6 inches. With the combination of diesel and electric motors, they were able to generate 5,500 horsepower while surfaced, 2,740 horsepower while submerged, they can cruise along on the surface at 21 knots while submerged, 8.75. They can go for 11,000 nautical miles, so they're able to operate in Japanese waters. They could be submerged for 20 or 48 hours. Test depth down to 250 feet, and they held five officers and 54 enlisted men. Five officers? It's a perfect mm-hmm. number for ours. It is. We have five officers in our boat, so we, we just don't have anyone else. <laughs> we find 54 <laughs> volunteers. You're the captain, and we're all exes. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get um, interns, so we don't have to pay. Oh, that's enlisted. a good idea. So 54 interns, should we put that up on yeah. Craigslist? Looking for 54 <laughs> interns for a submarine. Yeah. You will go down on the first dive. Yeah. We will join you after. <laughs> <laughs> you figure it out. Uh, so for weapons, they had eight torpedo tubes, held 24 torpedoes. They had one three-inch deck gun, 
It was originally outfitted with a smaller gun, but they were like, get this the hell out of here. It's not doing anything. It also had four machine guns. So these boats were extremely active in the Asiatic fleet for the U.S. during World War II. Overall, they sank 73 ships and, well, this includes one Japanese sub. Wow. So it should be 72 ships, one and boat. one boat, yeah. So something that's kind of interesting with one of these is the sailfish of this class sank a Japanese aircraft carrier, and I can't pronounce the name. It looks like Chuya. Something. And it was carrying 21 survivors from the submarine Sculpin. So only one of the prisoners survived the sinking. And the Sculpin was one of the boats that was assisting the rescue of 33 men when the Squalus sank. But the Squalus was raised back up. This was sunk during a test dive. The Squalus was raised back up and recommissioned as the USS Sailfish. It's real circular. That's real confusing. Yes. I'm real confused. I was sitting there for a while trying to figure it out. Yeah. So, so it sounds like the yeah. squalus sank. Yep. Sculpin came in to save people. Save people. But then they were able to raise the squalus yeah. back up. Became the sailfish. Yes. And then the sculpin got sunk or whatever, and they got captured. And yes. they're on this boat that gets sunk by the sailfish, which is what they the boat that they saved. Correct. Or not saved. They saved the people on the boat. The boat was raised. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, yeah, the uh, sailfish. Sunk that aircraft carrier and only one survivor. Yeah. Um, so anyway, this this boat is also the fixation of a TV movie documentary, Submerged, starring Mr. Sam Neill. That doesn't sound like a documentary. From if it's Jurassic stars, Park. It stars Sam Well, Neill. It's, it's, they called it a, what was it, like a, a docudrama or something like so that? So maybe I should have saved it for when we were watching that TV movie slash documentary. I which tried, I, which, I tried to find it and I couldn't find it. It's, it's, it's like a TV movie. <sighs> Yeah. Um, so anyway, this is kind of a sadder story. Mm. So we have a submarine that we all think is super badass. Wait, sadder than the case of 33 people and only one surviving? Yes. Wow, okay. All right. So what submarine has the most badass name? Seawolf. Yes. Yeah. So Vampire. Oh, the Vampire class. Oh, oh yeah. If That's... there was a USS Vampire or like USS <laughs> Frankenstein's Monster, <laughs> that would be amazing. I just want the USS Godzilla. Yeah, yeah, that's the best one. Are you typing that? Are you looking searching it, it up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Click, click, click. All right, so anyway, the USS Seawolf is a Sargo-class sub. And there was a situation off the coast of Indonesia. There was a fleet moving through the area, and there was a destroyer as an escort to Shelton, and that was torpedoed and sunk. But it was presumably, you know, an enemy submarine that did this and there was another destroyer the richard rowell in the area that began to search for submarines but there were submarines four of them in the fleet with the u.s and they said hey we need to know your location somebody just fired a torpedo four three out of the four were able to let them know their location but the sea wolf never did a strange kind of signal was received but the richard rowell thought it could have been an attempt to jam their sonar. So it launched these things called hedgehogs, which are anti-sub mortar rounds that shoot out in front of the ship. And they presumably sunk the sea wolf. So it was a friendly fire situation. But they also looked at war records after the fact, and there was no like recorded Japanese attack. Hmm. So it was more than likely a friendly fire situation on the wow. Sea Wolf. So it's kind of unfortunate. Not kind of, it is unfortunate. And that's when they decided to name the most badass class of subs the Sea Wolf. Boom, 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 boom. Can't wait to get our Sea Wolf. We will one day. Thank you. Alex is not here, but we got some pretty cool news. Yeah, like some a lot of news this week, I feel like. Yes. Yeah. Aston Martin has unveiled. A personal submersible. Yeah. I'm looking at pictures of that right now. You going to get one? Yeah, if it comes in, you know, black or something. All right. Well, yeah, the, the leather seats in it were kind of brown or tan. Are you able to tint those windows? <laughs> I don't want people seeing into my yeah. submarine. Better have a Bose sound When system. I'm boning the ladies. You get pulled over. Right? Pulled over by the water. Aqua cops. Right. <laughs> hey, look at the tint on that dome. Uh, all rights reserved. Aqua cops. <laughs> 
We just nailed that. That's our TV yeah. show. I like it. If they've got like a, I don't know, $10,000 introductory edition, I might uh, be able to spring for that. I don't think Aston Martin's going to have anything that low. I don't think so either, Kyle. That's the joke. Well, no, sh- Maybe used. Oh, yeah. What's the market like? Yeah, ch- ch- check Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> Looking for an Aston Martin submarine. Um, was there another one? There was not, There was other news as well, right? There's all sorts of news going on all the time. Alex is our <laughs> news, news guy. News happens, guys. Um, well, I see the stolen homemade submarine now on dry land in Oakland. That sounds like a fun one. I'm just seeing the title, though. So some stolen homemade submarine. We need to follow up on these. Yeah. Oh, oh, and then the other one I saw was the French. Uh, the French president was in Australia, and all the headlines were kind of hilarious. They were like Macron in uh, Australia to discuss submarines. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mac- Macron looks beyond submarines to forge closer ties with Australia. Macron begins Australia visit focused on submarines. Like, yeah, who isn't? Like, tell me something I don't know. If we ever run for office, that should just be our entire platform. Focused on submarines. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you guys want to live above the water? It sucks. <laughs> it's getting hotter. You can't breathe the air. You can do that all underwater. There's going to be more water than ever. Yeah. Got to take advantage of this. Correct. All right, Brom, do you got a countdown for us? Tube three, ready to fire, sir. Commence the countdown. I do, and it's uh, coincidentally enough, uh, both a countdown and news related. So, OMG. That works out tonight. So if uh, if Alex and I, the mustard man, and I ever had a baby, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, it would be tall, gangly, alien baby, but uh, this would be its segment, I suppose. It is the top five alternative sub-news uh, articles of the past week. So in weeks past, we've talked about things like subprime mortgages and mm. subway restaurants <laughs> closing down. That's right. Uh, by the way, I looked it up. Bowling Green has five subways. Oh, wow. We were one, we were one off. Never and enough. <laughs> to keep us all informed, I have gathered five pieces of news from other subcultures. Good. All right. Number five, we got a substitute teacher in Leavenworth, Missouri, told an African-American student, and I quote, Stop giving me that ugly black girl face. Oh, God. When apparently the student wouldn't stop, the substitute teacher <laughs> called for the principal to remove the girl from class. The principal, however, said, um, no, you're fired. And that was the end of that. I do like the, I do like the implication. Would he stop, would, wouldn't stop giving him that face. <laughs> He's like, I can't. This is my face. <laughs> yeah, unfortunate bit of news, but... Uh, that's the way the news goes sometimes. Number four, General Electric announced their subprime, subprime mortgage lending unit, Western Mortgage Company, is likely to file bankruptcy as they continue to battle lawsuits and subpoenas from the housing market collapse of 09. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a sub double play. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> <laughs> subprime mortgages and subpoenas. Love it. Very good. Very subtle. Yes. Number three, we got subterranean news. Swedish researchers have potentially discovered that vegetation is able to communicate to other plants using subterranean chemical signals. In a test using corn seedlings, young plants were shown to release oils into the surrounding soil when introduced to harmful scenarios, including animal invasion and ravenous insects. The oil was interpreted by neighboring plants in a way that caused the neighbors to grow less root material and more foliage. And I guess we can interpret that as we will, because I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> like, I physically know what that means, but I'm like, okay, wh- why? That doesn't, okay. What Great, effect does that have on me? I don't know. <laughs> it is interesting. <laughs> it sounds a little bit like the movie um, Super Mario Brothers. Right? Don't they all live like underground, like dinosaurs and shit? Uh. Anyways, the movie from the nineties. <laughs> <laughs> the movie? No, I think he's talking about the video game. Oh so no, I'm talking about the movie. Trash. The guy was Bob Hoskins was hammered the whole time. Was Good. that the John Leguizamo one? Yes. Yeah, it was. Hoskins. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Terrible. <laughs> Classic. What? 
Uh, number two, though, uh, grab your raincoats, Caribbean listeners. We have a preseason tropical or rather subtropical storm system that could form by week's end and bring flooding to parts of Cuba and Puerto Rico. <laughs> subtropical. <laughs> Great. <laughs> number one, in a similar vein, two women uh, set sail from Hawaii last year aiming for Tahiti. They were lost at sea for five months after claiming they encountered a tropical storm that blew them off course. The two women have finally been rescued in Japanese waters amidst strange circumstances. Wait a second. You might be saying, um, Brahm, uh, Hawaii and Tahiti are in the tropics, not the subtropics. What is the sub news here? I well, agree. I was saying that. Well... All of you submissives out there might be interested to know that one of the women, Jennifer Appel, was discovered to be a dominatrix. Oh, good. The kicker, <laughs> the kicker, a few years before this excursion, Jennifer published an erotic novel about two lesbians on a voyage at sea. Kind of makes you wonder. Does make me wonder. Wow. Let me wonder that for a second over here. Am I right? I don't get it. Yeah, think on that. Uh, I do. Is this can planned? I, can, I, can I add one to this list? Sure. Go for it. So I did want to note that on May 18th of this year, there will be a movie being released. It's called Book Club. Has anyone seen trailers for this garbage? No. Let me read you the the thing. So Diane, played by Diane Keaton, is recently widowed after 40 years of marriage. Vivian Jane Fonda enjoys her men with no strings attached. Sharon Candace Bergen is still working through her decades old divorce. And Carol, Mary Steenburgen's marriage is in a slump after 35 years. The lives of these four lifelong friends are turned upside down after reading the infamous Fifty Shades of Grey, catapulting oh them God. into a series of outrageous life choices. This is a real movie being released as a like to a lot of theaters. It will make. I'm calling it now. We can. I'm gonna say opening weekend is uh, 3.1 million. I think that's probably pretty pretty much wow. accurate. Yeah. yeah, that's. So it's a movie about people reading Fifty Shades of Grey. Yeah. Old Just in time for Mother's Day. For all those older mothers out there, I guess. Yeah, I can't say I'm surprised. I mean, this is basically the uh, antithesis to like the last Vegas movies and Bucket List, you know, all these Morgan right. Freeman and all these. Tommy uh, Lee Joneses. Yes. Doing these stupid comedies that our parents and grandparents are somehow enjoying. <laughs> <laughs> no, like the movies we watch, the submarine movies. Yeah. We're watching movies from when you were a kid. They're the best. Yeah. And I watch bad movies all week long at badmovietwins.com. Yeah. Jamie would probably kill for Las Vegas or something oh, like that. Oh, for sure. All right. <laughs> the only thing that looks good about that book club movie is that Don Johnson's in it. <laughs> I love Don Johnson. I love Don Johnson, too. If that's weird. Do you, know, do, you know, do you know the weird thing about that, that he's in that movie? His daughter's in Fifty Shades. Daughter is the main character of Fifty Shades of Grey, the movie. Oh, oh man. Man. Which is probably why he's in the movie. It probably is why he's in the movie. They're like, this would be so funny. And then they were doing it, they're like, you know what, guys? This isn't actually as funny as we thought it would be. No one actually, it's not really much of a joke. <laughs> he's a fractured shell of a, of a man with his daughter being nude on screen like 50 times every year. Oh, yeah. All right. All righty. You got some of those sweet, savory Zach facts? Before I get to the facts, I got uh, the one thing I forgot to say that I liked about the movie wasn't even in the movie. It was on the uh, poster on the <laughs> <Again>? Wikipedia page <laughs> where it says, you know, Operation Petticoat, Cary Grant, Tony Curtis submerged with five girls. No wonder the SSC Tiger turned a shocking pink. Thought that was a ridiculous <laughs> title to have on the movie poster. Huh. That's weird. I'm not I'm not sure what they're implying there. <laughs> right. Huh. A lot of things. Yeah. Oh shit. All, All right, right, hit it. Do 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 Zach Fax, it's Zach Fax. When you're going down, get some Zach Fax when you're going down. <laughs> okay, time for some Zach When you're going Fax. down, get some Zach Fax. Yeah. <laughs> Operation Petticoat Zach Fax Number one Originally Operation Petticoat Had the title Two Men in the Pink Fact <laughs> Interesting <laughs> why, why couldn't they keep that? Uh, you know You'd have to go back And um, search the interwebs For that an answer 
I'll look it up. I'll Google two men in the pink. See what I find. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm sure you're going to find Turn some... safe search off or else you won't be able to get through the old firewalls <laughs> from back in the day. <laughs> Next fact. Uh, the original sub used for filming was lost. This was due to workers accidentally painting it a deep shade of ocean blue. <laughs> <laughs> Can't have another disaster like that one. We got to keep this movie <laughs> under budget. Paint it pink. <laughs> Fuck it. Exactly. Well, here's a good one. The saying, don't get your panties in a wad, comes from this movie when they launched the women's underwear. <laughs> wow. No wonder I got an Oscar uh, nomination <laughs> coming up with the gems yeah. like that. Fact number four all the pigs used in this movie had the same name. Oh, I thought you were going to go much sadder for that one. <laughs> wow. You just a pen of pigs with the same name. He's throwing them into a wood chipper right. one after another. <laughs> oh, man. Where did you get that from? It's like, I was done with this one. <laughs> See you, Jerry. What was, it? what was his name? Did you have a name? No. Oh. <laughs> Didn't have a name. I want the viewer to tell us. Oh. All right. Here's the last fact. Cary Grant's Captain Journal he reads is actually Ed Harris's journal from Phantom. Fact. I believe it. Whoa. I came this close to... First time I ever come close to hitting a woman. Next page. I hit a woman today. (laughs) (laughs) I didn't think I'd enjoy it so much. (laughs) Thanks for listening to Submersion. Find us on SoundCloud and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Can't get enough of us? Don't forget to subscribe for new episodes every Thursday. And if you like what you heard, please go ahead and give us a rating. 